All right, well, uh, thanks very much um, to the organizers for the opportunity to come and, and visit Seoul. It's been too long since my last visit. Um, and so, since the title of the conference is Strings in Seoul, I thought I would be at least the token person to talk actually about strings. Um, and so, and this is some, some outgrowth of work that I've been doing over the past few years to try to understand aspects of ADS-CFT, not just at the supergravity level, but um, at, the, at the full uh, bulk string theory level. And the reason that's useful is that there are various aspects of uh, gauge gravity duality that are um, hard to see at the level of supergravity. Uh, for instance, what the configuration of the brains are in the background, uh, which uh, there is information about uh, if, you do, if you delve sufficiently deeply and carefully into, uh, into the string theory. So the talk is in two parts, uh, and I apologize that for that in advance. It's usually a mistake to talk about two different things in the same seminar. Um, but there are sufficient connections. I think it's worthwhile uh, to, to attempt to do this. And so the, the first part of the talk will be about uh, using orbifold constructs, constructions in string theory uh, to construct BTZ black holes. Uh, Ordinarily, one thinks of the BTZ black hole as the BTZ black hole is representing the ensemble of all of the states of a given temperature or microcanonically in a given band of energies. Um, but it's also possible to uh, build particular pure state black holes uh, using orbifold techniques. And that's what I uh, will describe in the first half of the talk. So the situation, the, the context is, um, is uh, string theory on a five torus uh, that's wrapped entirely by a collection of N5 NS5 brains uh, and N1 fundamental strings also wrapping the circle of the compactification. And one can take a decoupling limit of that situation um, where one takes the, the asymptotic, so, so usually you think of this as there's some, um, there's some throat Right, some asymptotically flat geometry, and then some throat that's sourced by uh, the collection of the brains uh, sitting somewhere close together. Um, and so there's some asymptotic value of G string. Um, and in the case of NS5 brains, the, there's a, a linear dilaton running down the throat. Uh, and so if we sit somewhere at some fixed position in the throat and we take g-string to zero, what's basically happening is the throat gets uh, pushed, the top of the throat gets pushed more and more into the UV and eventually in the limit g-string goes to zero, the entire linear dilaton throat extends all the way up to infinity um, with the asymptotic value of the string coupling going to zero. But at any finite position in the throat, the string coupling still has whatever value it had corresponding to what the value of the dilaton is at that particular radius. So you have a non-trivial interacting string theory even though the asymptotic string coupling has gone to zero. Uh, in addition, of course, there are these N1 fundamental strings. There's some radius which we might call the charge radius, call it Q1, which is where uh, the uh, back reaction of the strings on the geometry uh, becomes order one. And so if you, if you take a limit where the size of the circle that's wrapped by the strings is also taken to infinity, keeping the energy uh, fixed in units of the circle size, uh, that's a particular infrared low energy limit which uh, gets us to ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, where the azimuthal direction in this ADS3 is this uh, is this uh, circle that's wrapped by the strings. Okay? And because the background in that limit is, uh, is, is an ADS uh, limit, uh, its situation is dual to some uh, two-dimensional CFT. Okay. Now, we're going to be interested in looking at uh, particular half BPS states in this background. So, so what, what are we after? Um, 
uh, we're going to be looking at world sheet strength theory. World sheet strength, strength theory is an expansion around some particular background. So in the larger context is you have some asymptotically ADS space time describing some particular state in the two-dimensional CFT. Uh, we want, um, so, so what is world sheet strength theory? World sheet strength theory is some kind of perturbation, perturbative expansion of strings and their interactions around that particular background. So we have to choose which particular state in the CFT we're looking at small stringy excitations around, okay? And it turns out that the class of such backgrounds uh, arise when uh, we take the five grains that are in the background, we spread them out evenly around, so, so, so again, uh, the compactification, some five torus, in addition, the, uh, you know, asymptotically, there's some R4 that's transverse to the five brains. And uh, so we, we can separate out the five brains a little bit in that transverse R4 in some two-dimensional plane. And uh, the convenient thing to do is to symmetrically arrange uh, the five brains uh, in some along some particular circle in that transverse plane. Okay? And then we'd like to wrap all the five brains together so that they're all bound to one another. Okay? We can do that by uh, twisting the boundary condition so that uh, a five brain, when it comes up to here, periodically wraps around to another five brain. And so as long as the parameter k and n5 are relatively prime, what we've done is we've implemented a twisted boundary condition where we have a single five brain that's wrapping this twisted circle n5 times. Now, um, in order to get that configuration not to collapse in on itself, you know, basically all the fibrins would sh shrink the, the lower their energy if they all collapsed into the middle. To prevent that from happening, you give the system some angular momentum. That angular momentum then puffs up the geometry. And, and so uh, in the end of the day, what you find is the geometry you're looking at uh, is uh, ADS3 cross S3 mod ZK. The way you can understand the ZK um, is that um, in this picture, uh, in this picture of what the source is looking like, oops, um, essentially you can see the N5 fibrains if you look in the transverse plane, uh, you know, taking some cross section at some fixed position along the Y circle, you see that you cross N5 fibrains as you go around the source. If you go in the vertical direction, you cross K5 brains. Basically, what, there's, there's some kind of uh, non-topological torus, which the source is occupying, and it's wrapping some N5 comma K cycle in that torus. And what I've secretly drawn here is actually the T-dual of, the, of, the, of this uh, circle that the brains are wrapping. Uh, and to get the actual ADS3 geometry, one has to dualize along this direction. If you're crossing, and if you're crossing K five brains as you go along this direction periodically, then after T duality, those K and S five brains become K Kaluza-Klein monopoles. And if I stick K Kaluza-Klein monopoles together, they have in their core a ZK singularity. And that's this ZK that uh, is being described here. So this is kind of a long-winded explanation of the particular state that we're studying. The reason I'm going through it is that to convince you that string theory knows a little bit more than just that I have some kind of eight smooth ADS3 geometry. I can consider non-trivial states in that background where string theory knows uh, what the substructure is of the five brains. So the five brains aren't just dissolved in the background as flux, and we don't have to talk about them anymore. The five brains are actually there secretly uh, and if you excite the system sufficiently, you see the individual five brains re-emerging from that flux background. Okay. So uh, with that long-winded preamble, uh, what are we actually describing? Well, in this limit that I've described, we have an ADS3 background, so we can describe ADS3 and S3 uh, in some Euler angle parameterization of the group manifold because ADS3 is the group manifold SL2R, S3 is the group manifold SU2. And so the ZK orbifold we're going to do is basically just identify the group manifold under some particular conjugation by discrete elements on the left and the right. Okay? 
And so if we choose the left and right group elements to be the same group element, well, you can see that what's happening here is that at the origin rho equals zero, the coordinate sigma, the azimuthal coordinate in ADS3 is a redundant coordinate. It's basically locally the origin in some two-dimensional plane in polar coordinates, where rho is the radial coordinate and sigma is the angular coordinate. Okay. And so this group transformation at rho equals zero uh, is a fixed point because sigma, th this, this transformation is a translation in sigma by two pi over k. And so what we have is an orbifold singularity at the origin where we're quotienting you know, the natural angular periodicity of the coordinate is not two pi anymore, it's two pi over k. And if we do the same thing in S3 at theta equals zero, the psi coordinate is redundant. We also shift it by two pi over k. Then locally what we have is a product of two two-dimensional planes, basically what looks locally like an R4 mod zk orbifold singularity of the standard sort that, that we've known since the mid 80s. Um, okay, and so basically we have an orbifold singularity. It sits at rho equals zero and runs up the time direction in ADS-3, but it also, uh, for every value of the Euler angle phi, there's one of these singularities. So there's actually a circle worth of zk, or, if you like, the, your five-dimensional space, the locally R4 mod zk singularity, and then there's a fifth spatial coordinate, uh, which is the the coordinate phi. So basically this orbifold singularity runs around in a circle. And that, that's just coming back to here, right? This source locus is parametrized by phi. Uh, and so, so the phi brains still sit um, uh, along that circle uh, and then transverse uh, uh, in, in this direction, we saw that we get some kind of ZK singularity after a T-duality. Okay. Now, uh, we also know quite a bit about string theory in ADS-3 from going back to work of Givon Kudasov and Seiberg and Maldasana and Aguri, uh, that there, there's a complete map of uh, vertex operators in ADS-3 string theory. Uh, in particular, there are, half, there are some half BPS uh, uh, vertex operators that implement transitions. By the way, I should say, this orbifold preserves of the initial four comma four superconformal symmetry preserves half of the, the, the vacuum uh, supersymmetry algebra. So the, the, the background here is half BPS. So it's describing some particular half BPS state in ADS3 CFT2. And the, we can identify particular vertex operators. String vertex operators are things that create small excitations around the background. If we look at half BPS string vertex operators acting on a half BPS background, they preserve all the same supersymmetries, so they take you to some nearby half BPS state. Okay? But we could also consider, and in and, and particular what they do is they change the, um, uh, I should have said, um, all these half BPS states are labeled by uh, basically what's the winding condensate of the strings that's carried by the five brains. So, you know, what, what characterizes a winding condensate? It's the winding number of each of the individual strings. So each of the individual strings that are, that are bound to the five brains of these N1 strings can carry some particular polarization label and some winding, okay? And so how many strings there are in each winding and each polarization characterizes all the half BPS backgrounds. Um, the background that's this orbifold is one where you basically take all of the winding, you put it into a single kind of string winding mode with a single polarization uh, that describes this particular two-dimensional plane that the strings are spread out in, okay? So that particular state can be thought of as an excitation away from the ADS vacuum by a macroscopic amount where we, the, the, the state K equals one is the vacuum. And the state, say, k equals 2 or k equals 3 is what you get by um, applying some number of string vertex operators to the background, but not just a few of them, but some amount of order n. And so if you take the vacuum, you re-change, you, you re-engineer the winding condensate of the strings a macroscopic amount, that takes you to these vertex operator backgrounds. So if you like the this orbifold geometry as a state in the CFT, as you would expect, is what you get by applying some operator which has of order n 
uh, individual string excitations um, that take you away from the background to something which has a, a macroscopically deformed geometry, ADS3 cross S3 mod ZK. Okay. Now, um, with, with that as, uh, as a, a starting point, uh, we, can, we can start playing in some interesting games. Okay. So the state that I've described is, is this one. It's ADS3 part uh, is just uh, this conical, this ZK conical defect. Uh, if you like, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's locally ADS3 cross S3, except for the orbifold singularity. At the orbifold singularity, we have a local identification, a deficit angle that's 2 pi over K. Um, okay, and so that deficit angle just sits at the origin, rho equals zero, and runs up in time. So we just have some massive object in, in ADS sitting at the origin and doing nothing. And we can study string theory around that background if we're so inclined. But we can start doing more interesting things. We can, for instance, take um, this um, geodesic that's traveled by uh, the conical defect, and we can start moving it around in ABS using the ADS symmetries. So for instance, if we take this static defect and we boost it in some particular direction, okay? Well, the, the identity in SL2R is the point that sits at tau equals zero uh, and rho equals zero. That's, if, that's in terms of you know, Euler angle parameterizations of where you are in the group manifold. That's the origin, that's the identity element, okay? And so if we take the identity element and we conjugate it by a left and right boost, uh, what we get is something that uh, moves, look at the Euler angle parameterization, going in the sigma one direction is going radially in rho. So this boost takes the point at the origin and moves it out to uh, rho equals eta. So if I now take my massive object, I've pushed it away from the origin, the deepest redshifted place in ADS, to out, out some, some distance. If I let it go, it starts wanting to collapse back into the center of ADS. And so it'll just sit there oscillating back and forth uh, in the center of ADS in some kind of coherent oscillator motion. Or we can apply independent left and right boosts. If we do that, then instead of radially oscillating, we've also given the, strain, the, the defect a little bit of orbital angular momentum in ADS3, and so we get something that's executing some kind of wavy trajectory, which if I look at it from on top, uh, is just executing some kind of elliptical motion uh, as, as time goes on. Now, you can ask, okay, what am I doing in the CFT2? Well, usually easier to think about the CFT2 in Euclidean signature, so we want to take this standard Lorentzian cylinder of ADS and wick rotate it to Euclidean signature. What do we get? Well, the Euler angle parameterization of SL2R, or actually SU11, which is equivalent, uh, then under this transformation becomes a parameterization of Hermitian matrices of unit determinant, which is, uh, uh, otherwise known as the hyperbolic ball um, SL2C mod SU2. And the conjugation of group elements that we were just discussing uh, becomes a conjugation by the symmetry of this uh, hyperbolic ball, which is SL2C. So as usual, the independent left and right con uh, conformal transformations I can make on light cone coordinates in, in, um, uh, on, on the cylinder. Uh, becomes now uh, some SL2C symmetry of the Euclidean sphere at the boundary. Um, and what else do I want to say? Uh, oh, yes, the, um, the identification uh, by a discrete rotation that makes the conical defect in the center of ADS, we have to ask what happens to that under the wick rotation. Well, it turns out that of these sort of six parameter left and right group elements uh, that I can deform the solution by, roughly speaking, half of them continue to the same thing in SL2C. So there are particular, if you like, the diagonal S, SU11 sitting inside SU11 left and SU11 right, 
um, that diagonal element just sits naturally as the SU11 subgroup of SL2C. And so um, uh, uh, it's basically the same rotational transformation acts as making a conical defect both in Lorentzian ADS3 and in Euclidean uh, ADS3. And fortunately, this radial oscillation that I described, this radial excitation, also sits inside that, um, that uh, common uh, subgroup. So uh, the uh, boost transformation of the rotational identification, um, again, is something that lives both in the symmetries of global ADS3 and in the symmetries of the hyperbolic ball. And so this radial displacement uh, to a maximum radius in the Lorentzian theory becomes a radial displacement to a minimum radius in the Euclidean theory. So the boosted object wants to oscillate uh, back and forth in Lorentzian ADS. In the Euclidean theory, it's basically being shot in from the boundary, um, reaches a minimum radius, and then goes back out to the boundary at, at larger radius. Okay, and so, I mean, all of this is just some classical group theory that is, you know, straightforward to work out. Uh, why do I describe it? Well, um, once, you, once you realize that you can start moving these defects around in ADS, then you can put more than one of them in ADS if you put them far enough apart, okay? And uh, if, you, if you like, you know, what are we dealing with in CFT terms? In CFT terms, there, you're making some disturbance at the boundary uh, that makes the defect. Okay? In CFT2 terms, CFT2 lives on the boundary two-sphere, and you're introducing some you, you're, you're introducing some defect. What is that defect conjugate to? It's, it's conjugate to some vertex operator, uh, some local operator in the CFT2 uh, that is itself half BPS and, and makes uh, the vacuum excitation, okay? The, the uh, original static defect sitting at the origin is uh, sitting, if you, is that vertex operator is inserted at the south pole of the sphere. It's removed, the defect is removed again at the north pole of the sphere. And so it's just the standard, you know, CFT two terms, it's just I'm a applying some, some operator whose dimension is of order the central charge, maybe half the central charge or and over K, you know, one over K times the central charge uh, that's making this highly excited state in the, in the CFT2, okay? Uh, and it's just the usual state operator correspondence, right? I, 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 make, I apply an operator at the origin, it makes some uh, highest weight state uh, in the CFT2. And that highest weight state then just propagates up and then is removed uh, at, at the other pole of the sphere. When I boost things, what am I doing? I am applying some symmetry of the sphere. The symmetries of the sphere are generated by L minus one and, and L minus one, L plus one, L plus one bar in the CFT2. So this is just, this, this defect is what I get by displacing the vertex operator from the origin to some point X on the Euclidean sphere. And so it's just some coherent state operator. I apply e to the x l minus one, and I coherently translate the operator from the origin out to point x. But once I've moved the operator out to point x, I can put some other operator at the origin, or at some other point x prime. I can, you know, I can start putting these operators more and more operators in. And what I'm describing then is not just some two-point function uh, of the CFT. Um, but some multi-point correlation function where I've now inserted two creation operators creating two defects at separate points on the boundary sphere that then propagate through the bulk and are extracted at two conjugate points uh, in the northern hemisphere of the boundary sphere. And, you know, what does that Euclidean thing look like if I continue back to Lorentz signature? It's that I've displaced two defects away from the origin at the surface of time reflection symmetry, where they're both st stationary at their maximum radius. And then when I let time evolve, they fall towards each other and collide uh, at some finite time in the future. Okay. 
now, what's true is though, though, is that we can ask what is the structure of the metric that's generated by these two defects falling towards each other. And while it's true that, um, so, so, so the, the, the pictures here are, uh, I should, should say, again, any, anywhere you see a, a green surface, um, it's a surface that marks the boundary of the fundamental domain of the identification of the, of the group quotient. Uh, and so here, what I'm describing is, here's a defect. Um, and so it, it divides some kind of uh, hemispherical segment from another hemispherical segment. And the, the, Z2, the ZK, in this case, Z2 identification is you're instructed to identify this boundary, this uh, uh, spherical you know, wedge with this spherical wedge to make the conical defect, okay? Um, and so we have a, a second such defect where you know, this is being identified with this by folding it over with a, a, a pi rotation. Uh, around this axis, uh, and the Lorentzian, and so so if I if I ask you know what's the holonomy of the connection, the, the Ramanian connection uh, around this uh, defect, it's well it's just if I go once around, I pick up a factor of two pi over k rotational deficit angle, and if I go around this one, I pick up a two pi over k deficit angle, but those two pi over k identifications have been relatively boosted relative to one another by some boost transformation in SL2C. And so that boost makes these two rotate, you know, how to say this? Each one is conjugate to a rotation around the origin, but by boosts in opposite directions. And those boosts in opposite directions make group transformations that don't commute with each other. So while locally, if I go around just one defect, I pick up a holonomy of the connection, which is two pi over k. If I go around both defects, I pick up a holonomy, which is the product of the two elliptic, you know, each, each individual generator of the, def, of the defect is some two pi over k rotation. But the group element that I get from multiplying together the boosted uh, rotations is itself something that, uh, whose holonomy depends on, well, what, what's the group theory of multiplying these things? And, you know, if I've separated the defects far enough, then um, you know, what am I doing? I'm, I'm adding energy to the system. You know, I, it takes me energy to pull these things apart. And so when they slam together, there's a chance they could make a BTZ black hole. And, and what is the characteristic of a BTZ black hole? It's that the holonomy around this is conjugate to a boost. That is, it's a hyperbolic element of SL2C rather than a, an elliptic rotational element. Okay. It turns out that uh, for, for any, any finite separation of any ZK defect, you always make a BTZ black hole. That, that the product of, of uh, the individual transformations is always in the conjugacy class of BTZ black holes. Okay. Um, so, so here it is for Z2. Um, you can consider ZK and ZK prime. That means you have two defects with different masses. And uh, you know, if the, the, the nice thing to do is to go to some kind of center of mass frame where they, you, know, you boost one out and the other one out so that the energies of their you know, separation is, uh, are equal. And then when they fall together and they make the BTZ black hole, the BTZ black hole will be sitting stationary. If you didn't match, if you didn't go to the center of mass frame, then you could have a BTZ black hole you make is sloshing around the middle of ADS. Um, uh, you know, no reason that can't happen. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, we can, I should say, oh yes. So you say, we, we could ask, where is the horizon of this BTZ black hole? So, in the case of two Z2 defects, it's a little bit degenerate. Um, it's a little bit easier to say for Z3 and higher. Um, where, if you think about a BTZ black hole, um, the, the, the usual Lorentzian description of a BTZ black hole is a quotient of global ADS by a boost transformation. And so what the boost transformation does is it takes, if we look on a particular 
section of constant time, um, well, we look at on, on the surface of time reflection symmetry of this identification, um, there's a, the boost transformation will, will map some geodesic to another geodesic by the boost. Um, so this point, this, this, this curve is mapped to this curve under the boost symmetry and those two points are identified. This makes then the spatial geometry of BTZ on the surface of time symmetry and there's a minimal length geodesic which sits right in the middle and that's the horizon on the surface of time symmetry. If we think about the Penrose diagram of BTZ, it looks something like this, right? Uh, and there's some, this is the, the, you know, the radius and time direction. Uh, you should think of there being some spatial circle that's fibered over this. That spatial circle grows to infinite size out at the boundary, shrinks to some minimum size, which is the size of the horizon uh, of the BTZ black hole. So sitting here is some circle whose size is something like the horizon radius uh, of, of the BTZ geometry. And so that cylindrical structure is just what you get by taking the Poincaré disk and quotienting it by this uh, hyperbolic uh, translation. Um, so this is something similar where um, uh, because we're doing this Z3 identification, okay, under the Z3 quotient, if we look at on the surface of time symmetry, okay, this arc is identified with this arc. This arc is identified with this arc. Okay, and there is a closed geodesic, um, which is basically a circular uh, segment that goes from one arc to its counterpart for the other defect, then emerges because of the identification back to here, and then the identification means that this is something that's closed if it orthogonally intersects, if the red arc orthogonally intersects the blue arc, um, then um, there's no kink in the trajectory uh, as I undergo this identification. And so this is just some closed loop with no kinks in it. So it's a closed geodesic, and you can convince yourself that it has minimal length in its um, in its, in its topological class. So this is, uh, according to some work of Brill and others 20 some years ago, uh, an apparent horizon of the resulting geometry. So, so basically what's happening is that uh, you, um, you start off with two defects in the past that emerge from some past singularity. They reach some maximum separation and then they collapse back into a future singularity. And this is saying that even at the surface where they're maximally separated from one another in Lorentz signature, they're still inside the horizon. So the way you should probably think of this is the way we've come to think of preparing states in ADS CFT. That is, you start from the Euclidean theory with the Euclidean vacuum. So you're in this picture here, okay? Take the southern hemisphere, say, of the hyperbolic ball. You prepare some state by starting with the vacuum and then applying a pair of defect creating operators, and then you reach the surface of time symmetry. That prepares a state in the CFT. And so then we're free to take that state in the Euclidean CFT, wick rotate time, and consider its evolution in Lorentz time after that. This is common prescription in, say, Schwinger Keldish formalisms or, or Hartle Hawking, however you want to think of it. And once you've prepared the state with two defects separated, those two defects in Lorentzian time then just collapse into a singularity and make the BTZ black hole. Okay. But we don't make the thermal field double in BTZ. We make, just a second, we make a particular state, okay? Because this boundary arc here is continuously connected to this boundary arc on the boundary, because this point is the same as this point, this point is the same as this point. We don't have, a, we don't have two disconnected boundaries, we have a single boundary, uh, which has been identified through the orbifold uh, procedure. And so there's some 
apparent horizon, a single asymptotic boundary, and then some region here which we might think of as being inside the black hole that you're making. So in contrast to the usual you know, means of pre preparing BTZ black holes via thermofield doubles where you have some kind of rotational symmetry, you know, the solution is periodic in imaginary time, and the geometry stops at the Euclidean horizon. And so you don't have any way of probing inside the horizon of BTZ black holes by starting from the Euclidean picture because the Euclidean, the, the interior of the black hole is completely excised by the Euclidean continuation. Here, you have access to some part of the geometry after you do the Lorentzian continuation, which you should think of as being, in some sense, inside the black hole. And I think this is interesting for that reason. There is a question. I mean, the picture on the right. The, the, uh, I mean, the picture on the right uh, is a constant time slice of BT, BTG black hole? Or? It's, it's this surface of time reflection symmetry. So all these geometries I'm preparing, I prepared them in such a way that there is a time reflection symmetry between okay, okay, positive time okay, and negative time. time okay, okay. And so, so um, uh, that's essentially because I've, I've placed these defect operators uh, at conjugate points under reflection about the equator of the... Of so the, the thermal circle direction is not drawn uh, basically here. Uh, thermal, the thermal circle. The thermal circle is not drawn here. So, um, um, yeah, so, so these, these geometries that are being prepared do not have a rotational isometry. So they're not periodic in imaginary time. Um, and uh, that's, I think, related to the fact that they're creating some particular pure state black. They're not creating sort of the generic um, mixed state, you know, uh, black hole that you would get by the standard prescription of Euclidean gravity. Rather, it's a way of preparing particular states in the CFT that are dual to particular pure states. Right. In other words, it's just what you would expect, right? If I, if I took the CFT, starting from the vacuum, applied a bunch of operators, and then said, OK, what do I get at some particular time? I get a particular state in the CFT. It's a linear superposition of some basis states of highest weights and descendants and so on, but it's a particular pure state. And so the state that's being made here is, is a particular pure state, not an ensemble of states. And in particular, there's no reason for it to have any kind of of uh, isometry under under Euclidean continuation. Okay. Um, you know, once you've started playing this game, um, you can play it as much as you want. Right? All I have to do is I keep pushing the operators away from the origin, particular places. If I push them far enough away, they don't bump into their effects of the rotational identification don't collide with one another. Um, and so you can just do it as much as you want. So, um, so here's an example where uh, I have a trio of um, Z2 defects. Okay? A range symmetric in a circle, that's not essential. You could do things more general. It's just for purposes of illustration. Okay? So the dashed line is my closed geodesic, which is the apparent horizon of this geometry made by three defects. Okay. Um, and this whole region here would be the fundamental domain of the, of the orbifold uh, geometry. Again, this is just a picture of the surface of time symmetry, just for illustrative purposes. But once I've introduced that ring of three defects, nothing prevents me from introducing three more a little bit further out. So here's three more defects. Here's one, two, three. Okay. Um, and you know this defect is the same as this defect because I've identified this arc with this arc. Okay. So while it looks like I have six things here, there are actually only three Z2 defects here. And uh, this green arc then is identified with this green arc under this rotational symmetry of this defect. Okay, 
Um, but if I, I, if I sew this green arc to this green arc, then that makes this thing into um, yet another Z2 conformal defect. And so you can see the, the game that I'm playing here is that uh, the fundamental domain of the six defects is now um, you know, what I had before, but now I chop out a little bit more. Um, and so what's the fundamental domain is just this region, et cetera. Okay. And now I've tessellated the hyperbolic disk of the surface of time symmetry uh, with hyperbolic triangles for, to aid your visualization and convince you that the length of the dashed red closed geodesic is actually the same as the length of the solid red closed geodesic. So the geometry in between those two, the, in this region here, looks like this. It has two circles of exactly the same length, which are closed geodesics, which are minimal surfaces of the spatial slice. And then three defects, um, sorry, three defects, these three defects, uh, between those two closed geodesics. So it's a building block for what you might call a bag of gold geometry, because once I've started this game, I can chain as many of these things together as I want, placing rings of three defects ever further out towards the boundary, and this makes some geometry whose outer horizon is the same length as all of these other closed geodesics, but I basically can put an arbitrary amount of geometry inside the horizon um, and get a pure state black hole um, that uh, is of the same mass uh, as, as the pure state black hole I would get without introducing these three extra defects. So it's clear that in this way I can make as many geometries in the same mass range as I want that are all pure states in the CFT. Um, and the question is, okay, at some point I'm overcounting because with this, with this uh, horizon uh, length, uh, you know, there are e to the s states where s is uh, proportional to this length. And, and so, you know, at some point I'm making too many classical geometries, they have to start being you know, related to each other, and that's been a subject of, of uh, interesting constructions that have appeared over the last uh, year or so in the literature. So um, I see I've only got about 15 or so minutes left, so let me just be quick. It's clear that, um, uh, that once I start playing this game, I can introduce these conical defects anywhere on the sphere and I'm getting some kind of bulk geometry that is the bulk dual of some particular correlation function of heavy operators in the CFT2. And by, by heavy, I mean of order n, but less than the threshold for making a, a BTZ black hole. And so what the world sheet theory is computing for you then is perturbative string light excitations around that heavy background. So it's a way of calculating in the bulk mixed correlation functions of some light operators together with some heavy operators uh, in the dual CFT. Uh, a particular interest is a very special case where we consider two Z2 defects. Um, the, the, the Z2 defects turn out to have, um, well, they have a uh, conformal dimension and an R charge that are proportional, and turns out they're N over four. So if I, if I plot all the half BPS defects, they basically live along some line in the Ramon sector. Um, and the Z2 defect lives here. So if I take two of those Z2 defects, they basically make something that sits here at threshold. And that's exactly at the threshold of the BTZ black hole. So, um, so, but it's, but, the Z2 defects that I've been describing actually turn out to be in the Ramon sector. The product of two such defects then is, an, is a state that lives in the Niver Schwartz sector, and it's basically this state here. So the idea is that, is that in the limit, in the, in, the, in the OPE limit of two Z2 defects, where I bring the two defect operators close together, the, they make a State, which is a pure state BTZ black hole in the NS sector, which is exactly at the zero mass BTZ threshold. 
but you can ask, okay, what's going on in the CFT and what's going on in the bulk? Well, something very interesting is going on in the CFT because in the OPE limit, uh, we're looking at some kind of three-point correlation function between two Z2 defects, which are sitting on top of each other, and making some uh, other half BPS state in the NS sector. That's something which is extremely BPS protected. And so we don't have to calculate it in the complicated place where the CFT is strongly coupled. We can calculate it any place in the moduli space of the CFT. In particular, we could calculate it in the weak coupling region of the CFT, uh, where it's described by uh, symmetric product orbifold. And so, um, so, again, the particular state that's being described is some particular conjugacy class of the symmetric group, for those of you who know what the dual CFT looks like in weak coupling. And we can just ask, what is the OPE of two states which are living in this particular twisted sector of the symmetric group? And uh, the answer is that uh, it's a superposition of states of different numbers of cycle lengths in the symmetric group. But the point is that it's a more or less continuous distribution that extends all the way out to maximally twisted sectors. So the idea is that these very coherent defects, when you bring them on top of each other, they make some state which is Hagedorn-like in the sense that the, the you know, remember what is the, the, the two here? It's describing the winding number of the strings that are making up the background state. So if I take this product of two things that are, are making, you know, short twisted strings of length two, when I slam them together, they make strings of all possible lengths. And, uh, and so, so, you know, maybe not so surprising, the string theory that describes five brain dynamics in the decoupling limit is some strongly coupled string theory called little string theory. And this is just some description of the little string state that I'm making when I collide these two defects. Um, and uh, so what I'd like to believe is that um, what we're seeing here is a bulk realization of what we expect to resolve the singularities of black holes, namely the black hole is some kind of deconfined state of the dual gauge theory. Uh, and the deconfine, the things that deconfine uh, in ADS3 CFT2 are the non-abelian excitations of the five brains, which are called little strings. And so um, the fact that when you prepare this state using Euclidean evolution and then you let them collide in Lorentzian evolution, the state that you're making that's living here is some kind of non-abelian string state. And um, so uh, it's very suggestive, I think, that the thing that's resolving the singularity is the same thing that accounts for the entropy. That is, the non-abelian string gas uh, of the little string is the thing that's responsible for the BTZ black hole entropy. Uh, and so uh, it seems to be also the thing that gets produced when you, col when, when you collide the two defects to make the black hole. So the fact that a singularity appears in the bulk geometry is seemingly an artifact of the weak coupling approximation to string theory, that it's the non-abelian strong coupling dynamics that should be resolving that singularity, and you see it in this OPE limit um, as uh, the, the bulk state that's being created by uh, uh, this limit of colliding the two defects. Okay. Uh, so I see I've pretty much used up my time just describing the first half of the talk. I was afraid that would happen. But let me just, uh, well, I can either stop there or I can just do an executive summary of the second half of the talk. Um, all right, well, it's fun. So let me, let me spend a little bit of time this. So, so I've described for you a way of making in world sheet string theory, BTZ black holes. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon in, in, in ADS3 string theory with NS fluxes. Um, which is that perturbative strings can get out to the boundary of ADS at finite cost in energy. And you might say, that, that sounds crazy, because if I take a string and I stretch it out to the boundary of ADS, its proper length goes to infinity. So isn't it super heavy? And the answer is no. 
because th threading through all of ADS3 is electric three-form flux that the string is charged under. And so there's an electric Lorentz force that pushes this string. So, so if you like, here's ADS. No, let me go here. Okay. Here's ADS. And um, here's my winding string out near the boundary. Okay. As it moves up in the time direction, and winds around the azimuthal direction, it experiences a, a radial Lorentz force. And that Lorentz force exactly counterbalances the tension. It's a feature of the fact that these objects are essentially BPS, or almost BPS. And so if strings can get out to the boundary of ADS3, uh, if they can be Hawking radiated, then you'll have this constant stream of winding strings that are being produced by the BTZ black hole. And they can get out to infinity. So in contrast to usual ADS-CFT, where we think of you know, states in ADS as you know, all the supergravity modes live in some kind of bound states that exponentially decay as you go out radially. But these winding strings live in some kind of plane wave states. Um, and so they can get out to infinity. And so the winding sector so, so Hawking radiation into these bound states just creates some kind of thermal atmosphere that's bound to the black hole. But in this other super selection sector of winding strings, in principle, there's a flux that goes out to infinity. And so BTZ black holes in this particular limit with just NS fluxes, has an, it, even, even though it's ADS, it has an S matrix, but only in the winding sector. So, that prompted me to ask, well, what, is, what does that look like? What's the emission rate? Um, and so on. Well, um, not surprisingly, it's all group theory. As I've tried to convince you, the BTZ black hole itself is some kind of quotient of global ADS by some hyperbolic transformation. Um, and, uh, and so the group manifold is being identified, indeed, under a left and right boost. Um, OK, and so then we can ask, uh, what are these winding strings? Well, they're basically strings that are closed. They're the twisted sectors of that orbifold. So they're strings that are closed only up to the identification that you've made of the, of the group manifold. Um, and uh, a, a quick way of describing them is to start first by thinking about point-like geodesics of localized uh, strings, and then doing a what's called a spectral flow transformation, which basically multiplies uh, the geodesic by a left and right uh, Z and Z bar dependent group element. So this takes solutions of the Wessimino Witten model to other solutions of the Wessimino Witten model that have W units of winding around the azimuthal circle of uh, the BTZ geometry. And so what's the Hawking process? The Hawking process is something which basically looks at an anti string, which you can think of as a string running backwards in time, uh, along. Um, the, um, uh, along one of these uh, winding solutions that then tunnels across to um, uh, become a string that's running forward. So this is just you know, Feynman's way of thinking about pair creation, as you have a particle running backwards in time, turns around and becomes a particle running forwards in time from somebody who's observing time slices that looks like pair creation. So this is pair creation of wound strings near the horizon. And there's a very pretty calculation that I adapted due to Krauss and uh, Wilczek from the mid 90s um, that um, results in the emission rate being um, exponential in the change of the entropy of the black hole during the emission process. The way that happens um, is uh, that, uh, you know, if you're looking at, a, at this process, um, all of the heavy lifting is the piece of the process near the horizon where, the, where the, you go off this classical trajectory uh, and hop onto another classical trajectory going outside the horizon. So the suppression comes from the fact that that's not classical trajectory, so there's some imaginary part to the string action. So e to the is becomes some e to the minus something suppression. And what's the suppression? It's the fact that the 
starting black hole has more entropy than the final black hole. Uh, and, and so uh, this is e to the minus something. And this little tunneling from inside the horizon to outside the horizon can be computed in a WKB approximation. Uh, it boils down to evaluating what's called the reduced action for the trajectory. Uh, and you only need to care about the part of that, that process that's happening right at the horizon, from just inside to just outside. And in that limit, uh, the radial momentum in this P, PDQ that you're trying to integrate has a pole at the horizon. The coefficient of the pole is entirely in terms of determined in terms of geometrical properties, the energy, angular momentum, and charge of the string being emitted, and the dual potentials, the angular potential, the gauge potential for the charge, um, and the surface gravity of the black hole. So the residue of this pole is something completely geometrical. And uh, once you integrate it across the horizon, you pick up an imaginary part that comes from the principal value prescription for avoiding this pole. And, uh, and then, you know, because it's geometric properties of the horizon and conserved charges, whatever conserved charges are being carried away by this string are being extracted from the black hole. So the, chain, the entropy of the string being emitted subtracts from the mass of the black hole, its angular velocity, angular momentum subtracts from the angular momentum of the black hole, and most important, the string winding charge that's being carried away subtracts from the F1 charge of the BTZ black hole. And so then using the first law of black hole thermodynamics, this quantity is just minus a half the change in the entropy. Okay, the entropy of BTZ black holes, well known since forever, it gets related to geometrical properties of the horizon, namely the inner and outer horizon radii. Uh, and so the angular potential and uh, the surface gravity um, and the B field at the horizon are all determined in terms of those quantities. Uh, notice that, uh, the, that, that, that the change in the entropy for emitting a winding string is proportional to the horizon area. So the bigger you make the BTZ black hole, the more and more suppressed this emission is, but because it's the only channel by which there's an S matrix of things going out to infinity, uh, you just wait long enough and it happens. Okay. So last thing I'd like to, to um, mention is an interpretation of this, of this formula. Okay, this fact that the emission probability is the change in e to the minus change in the entropy. So there are two factors of entropy in this formula, and they actually play two asymmetric roles. The e to the sf appearing in this formula, you should think of as a statement that uh, the emission probability doesn't know about what microstates you're actually making a transition between. So it just sums over all the final state black holes you could possibly have. So the sum over final states is just a factor of e to the sf if the matrix elements are more or less generically of similar magnitude for every final state black hole. The e to the minus si is the square of this matrix element averaged over states in some way. Um, and the, 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 one of the justifications for that is that if you consider other processes involving black holes, like say, black hole pair production in a back, you know, charged black hole pair production in a background field. There's a final state black hole, but there's no initial state black hole, right? The initial state's the vacuum, you know, with some electric field. And so the pair creation process, the matrix element is now the Schwinger pair production rate of the black holes instead of um, some kind of e to the minus si factor for the initial, for, you know, because there are no black holes in the initial state. And so this was calculated by you know, Garfinkel et al. In, in the early 90s, and, and they found indeed that there was a factor of e to the SF, but since there's no black hole, there's no e to the SI. So, um, so the association of this factor with the matrix element for the process uh, is consistent with, uh, with that. It's also consistent with uh, ideas of eigenstate thermalization, where off-diagonal matrix elements are suppressed by e to the minus the entropy over two. It's just that here, we get, the outcome of the calculation is that it's not some you know, average 
entropy or something. It's the entropy of the initial state, which is responsible for um, the uh, strength of the off-diagonal matrix elements. Okay. And so this is telling us that basically everything comes from phase space. The probability, the, the matrix elements are just the phase space of the initial black hole, the, the sort of size of its state space. The, you know, the, the, the sum over the final states is just, you know, the sum over the final state phase space. Um, and so um, you should think of the black hole uh, transition matrix element spitting out one of these winding strings as just being governed by sort of the ratio of the amount of entropy in the initial inside of the black hole um, and then the entropy of a slightly smaller black hole with a string outside it. And the ratio of those two entropies is all that governs the process, that you know, there's nothing other than that. And so black holes are black because there's an h-bar in all of these formulas, the area of the horizon over h-bar. And so the classical limit sends the density of states inside the black hole to infinite size. And so this ratio goes to zero. The temperature goes to zero because it's proportional to h-bar. And so in classical gravity, something falls into the black hole. It sees in an infinite size phase space. It starts ergodically exploring it because it's a thermal system. And it's just happily sitting there saying, oh, there's still more phase space to explore. So let me go do that. And it never comes back out. But as soon as you turn on finite h-bar, there's a finite density, there's a finite volume of phase space inside the black hole. And some finite fraction of the time, whatever you threw in finds itself back outside and then can run off to infinity. And so, so that, I think, is the physics behind the calculation um, that, that I did. Um, and so, last thought, where are this, these winding strings that are coming out, where are they? Uh, well, the Hawking calculation says that, that uh, whatever you threw in to make the black hole sits here at the singularity, and then there's some pair production process that goes on here that has nothing to do with what you threw in. But if the evaporation process is to be unitary, then the strings that are streaming out to infinity through the radiation process have to be some kind of scrambled version of the strings you dropped in to make the BTZ black hole to begin with. And the Gauss law then says that, you know, the, this, this string coming out has to be some reconstituted version scrambled of the strings that you thought were sitting at the singularity. So in order to get the emission amplitude correct, basically you have to replace this, um, this anti-string inside the horizon has to be replaced by the ensemble of strings that are making up the background black hole. And, you know, what does the Gauss law tell you? The Gauss law keeps track of where the, where the string charge is. So, you know, the standard Hawking process is one where the N1 strings that you dropped into the black hole are just sitting at the singularity, and the way that the string uh, charge of the black hole goes down is by having some anti-string, which is just inside the horizon, which, has, which is you know, causally separated from these guys. And so that, that, that leads you then into the various information paradoxes. So if, if the string that's being emitted is to be some reconstituted scrambled versions of these guys, then these guys have to be sitting somewhere near the horizon just before the emission process happens. And so to me, that says something akin to a fuzzball picture that the black hole interior can't be the vacuum. The fundamental strings that are being radiated have to spend at least part of their time near the horizon in order for their emission to have something to do with the microstate of the black hole that you made. Okay, so let me stop there and uh, thank you for your time.